you will have seen the typical planar head before, I'm sure. This is a very useful tool to explain to people the planes of the head and how they function. Usually planar heads are a little bit abbreviated in my opinion, and I guess they have to be in order to be general enough to explain every head and not just one specific head. As I continue to add clay to this sculpture, which as you've seen is the way I work the majority of the time, though later I'll talk about some exceptions to this rule. As I continue to add clay to this sculpture, I work to emphasize the plane changes and volumes. What I try not to do is to lose these. If anything, I'll look for more of them than I think I will eventually need, because I know that later it will be easier to lose things like this, rather than attempting to find them and dig them out of my mass of clay. You will be able to observe in my work a very distinct depth between the forms, but this is only part of the equation that makes this technique work. We also need enough volume to each form, and the planes making up the forms must be well thought through, observed and implemented. Without these present, the next step will fail and the work will therefore look poor. What tends to happen for beginners is that the most easily and readily available concepts are the ones that they understand and implement first, and this is natural of course. And in this scenario the most available concept is going to be have more depth and more space between the forms than you think you will eventually need. That's very easy to do and so everybody sort of does that. The problem is that once we reach the next step where forms are being blended together, we find ourselves in the difficult position of losing the information and making our work therefore look very flat and boring. This is not what we are after, of course. In order for the forms to be allowed to continue to be as vibrant as they were when they were being blocked in with more depth and space between the forms, we have to have enough volume present in each form to support the addition of clay into the transitions. So what does this mean? It means that we need enough volume per form so that when the clay is added into the transition between the form, the form doesn't become flat and disappear. It can be difficult to find the correct balance here since too much volume will look weird, of course. It's impossible, sadly, to prescribe exactly how much volume you need to add. Just know that you need enough volume to support clay added into the transitions. And by working the clay into the transitions slowly, you'll be able to see whether or not the forms you've established disappear as you do. And if they disappear, they are lacking in volume. And if they stay vibrant, they have enough volume. In addition to volume per form, we have planes, of course. Every form is made up of a series of planes. We can't have planes without having volume, of course. We need volume to support the planes. In the beginning, I like to keep things really simple and only consider where the plane must face. So essentially, is this plane facing the light or does it face vertically in relationship to the light or does it face downwards away from the light? And this is why overhead lighting is preferable in my opinion. With well-drawn forms on the surface of our work, well-placed and well-proportioned, and with the planes following this pretty simple concept of facing upwards, neutral or downwards, we will already have come a really long way to explaining what we are after explaining. It will also help if we keep in mind that with every halftone change we are going to have plane changes. Between every form we have plane changes. If you think you see a change in value and draw the outline of a form in that area, the reason you are seeing a change in value and perceive that as a form is because there are plane changes occurring which separated that form from all the other forms around it. And it is not usually simply a depression, it is a plane change. So try to keep that in mind. Transitions are happening between two planes, they're not sort of dips in the surface. They're not a pit in the surface essentially.
problems occur later in the process when we don't consider to the extent that we need to the volume of the forms, the planes that said volume support, and of course all the self-explanatory stuff like positioning and proportions. Adding depth between the forms support all of these ventures and allows for increased flexibility, but does not guarantee success when it comes to transitioning one form into another. Transitions should never be considered solutions to problems, but merely as a byproduct of good decision making. Essentially what I'm saying here is that where most people would want to search for the answers in the transitions, they won't find the answers there. The answers to the problem of transitioning one form into another is found in volume, plane and in drawing. Speaking of transitioning forms, one of the great benefits that working from life gives you so easily is the range of values present in the transitions between forms. This means that when working from life we find great variety and we can also begin to better understand how soft transitions between form actually are or rather should be. Most of us, including me, tend to make transitions too harsh and too strong, which leads to a bit of a chiseled and unnatural look. It's something I always have to combat in my own work and observation from life always helps me realize how soft transitions need to be. So since I have a model here today, I'm going to progress with the transitions as well. I only do so once I feel the volume, planes and drawing is in a decent enough place of course. They don't have to be finalized or perfect, but I need to at least feel like they are working really well well enough to support the addition of clay in the transitions. And sadly, as I've said many times in this video, there's no recipe here and only experience can, can guide you and let you know when you're ready to transition forms into one another. I once also thought that all my issues regarding transitions needed to be dealt with by carefully modeling the clay that is in between the forms. But I don't really think that it's this way anymore. If the work that precedes the work on the transitions is done well, then the transitions sort of happen on their own almost. They will start to look natural on their own. I have a few strategies to help me make sure I don't ruin any other work that I did before, so let me explain those. First and foremost, it's important to try not to take away the clay that now is used to describe the volume and the planes of the form. This means that going after this piece with a rake tool and raking it down aggressively is not going to be a good solution for us. If you did so, eventually you might end up flattening out your forms enough, dragging enough clay into the transitions for them to become soft, but by doing so, you will sacrifice the volume of your forms and in doing so, the planes will be lost as well. So instead, let's add clay into the transitions using a modeling tool. Now this can be done rather quickly and roughly, and you can see that I even use my fingers from time to time. If the piece is large enough, you can do so, or if your finger is small enough. The important part is to set up a bit of variety already at this stage. Decide by observing your reference where the darkest transitions are, where the ones in the middle are and where the lightest ones are. You should also look for areas where the transitions between the forms disappear completely. So essentially we are going to have four different levels of transitions to begin with, four different values. This might seem like a small number when you're looking at your reference and see hundreds, but it's going to set you up in a way that's not too generic, but also not so rich in variety that we lose track of where we're at. Consider this similar to what you will see often done in drawing. 
we will do the outline first in drawing and then we will set up a dichotomy between the light side and the shadow side. So we'll have outline, light side, shadow side. And even when we are aiming at creating a full value drawing, it's a good idea to start with two or perhaps three values. Later, we can expand into more values. Certainly, this is not the only way of doing things, of course, but it's very effective and a good way of drawing if we are working under a single light source, which is what I would recommend you to be doing if you're trying to make representational work better.